That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go uh, over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. They were also, there were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that he was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to, said to him, Teacher, don't you care? If we drown, he got up, rebuked the wind and the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. As we continue in our series of uh, life and ministry of Jesus, um, you know, what I wanted to kind of address uh, the objective of this series. And in this series, uh, I want to highlight the authority and power of Jesus. The authority and the power of Jesus. So it all goes back to the mission statement. If we are to be like Jesus, if we were to, uh, to grow and mature like Jesus and become like him, that we need to understand who he is, the things that he taught, the things that he did. And I feel like there's no other, no better thing to do than to look at what set Jesus apart from all the other uh, religious leaders or teachers of his time, both before and even after, which is his authority and his power. And today we see one demonstration of that power that Mark uh, describes in chapter 4. The reason why we look at the authority and the power of Jesus is to to draw one conclusion. is to see and understand that Jesus really is or was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. When we come to chapter 4 of Mark, uh, in verse 1, we see kind of a a scene, the setting of the scene here. In chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus says this, or Mark tells us, Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into the boat and sat in in it out on the lake while all the people were gathered along the shore at water's edge. And Mark chapter 3, verse 7 through 8 also kind of gives us the same image here. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake. Now, what is this lake? Uh, This is the Sea of Galilee, basically. Okay? He went to the lake and a large crowd followed from Galilee. When they heard about all that he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Jesus' popularity was soaring. The first point this morning I want us to to see is that Jesus' popularity rose because of his demonstration of power. Jesus' popularity rose because of his demonstration of power. You know, people were amazed at his teachings. They were amazed at the miracles that Jesus was performing. And this map that is up, and also if you look, turn your bulletin over, it's also another better view, perhaps. If you, I, if you look at the top of the map, um, it's kind of small, but if you look at the top, kind of in the center, l- look for the Sea of Galilee. <coughs> Towards the bottom, you will find the Dead Sea. Follow the Dead Sea up the Jordan River to, you, to, no, to the north, and you see a Sea of Galilee, or gate, the Lake Galilee, it says there. Okay? And at the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee is Capernaum. Okay, that's where Jesus is. That's where this story takes place. He's at Capernaum. And, the, and Mark tells us in chapter 3, verse 8, he lists all these different regions where people are coming from. He says Jerusalem. So Jerusalem will be south of that. Find Judea, and you'll see Jerusalem right above uh, Bethlehem. He mentions this area called Idumea, which is south of Judea. Okay? And he also identifies two cities. They're on the northern coast. Tyre, Sidon, on the northern coast. Okay? If you look just where Capernaum is, and think about people that are coming down from Idumea. This shows you 
that the people were traveling from all over the region. What, what is modern day Israel, basically, if you look at Jews, Judea, and Edomia? People were traveling great distances to see Jesus. Now, they, don't have, they didn't have modern transportation like you and I do. You know, they can't get in a car and drive. You know, I, I don't know how many miles that might be, maybe a couple hundred miles. They don't have a car to get there in one day. Most likely, their mode of transportation was by foot. So if you're thinking about the distance that people are traveling just to go see this Jesus, what's the furthest you would walk to hear some kind of a, a famous person, whether it's in academia or, or you know, uh, whatever interest that you have? An author comes, or your favorite author comes, and you know they're going to be in downtown Powell's Bookstore. Would you walk there from your house? If you live closer, perhaps, but if you live, let's say, if you were at church, would you walk from here to Powell's Bookstore? Probably not. That's about, what, 10 miles, maybe? These people are traveling great distances to go see Jesus. Sometimes they were traveling great distances to take the sick, their friends or they themselves, because they knew that when they went to Jesus, that there was healing or the possibility or potential of healing. It would take them multiple days to travel to go and see Jesus. Yet they walked. And they went there and they stayed all day. Could you imagine if you were sitting here all day long listening to me talk? Yeah. (laughs) If the roles were reversed, I would say the same thing. (laughs) We're just not accustomed to it, but the people. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. This whole section, we're told that people stayed there all day long. Jesus taught all day long. You know, as people, so many people came. They were traveling such great distances. And they came and they were kind of pressing around Jesus. And Jesus is already kind of backed against the shore. And people are coming and coming and coming. So they asked, hey, why don't we, why don't we get a boat ready? Let me hop in the boat, kind of sit away from the coast a little bit. And that's where he sat. And that's where he taught all day long. He taught them in parables, we're told. In verse 35, when evening came, that's where we pick up the story. Jesus has been teaching all day long. When evening came, Jesus really felt like, hey, I need to kind of get away. I love you guys, but I need to go get some rest. So he asked us, he tells his disciples, hey, let's go to the other side. They take him just as he is in the boat. So Jesus and his disciples are already in the boat. That's where he's teaching. When Jesus says, hey, let's go to the other side, there's an immediate action. The the reason why I love the book of Mark is Mark shows events. He doesn't spend any time kind of wrapping up from one one event to and introducing another one. He is just like, he talks about an event, he immediately moves to another one. So here we see Jesus says, hey, let's go to the other side. Immediately, Mark tells us they left. They headed out. As soon as the words left Jesus' mouth, hey, let's go to the other side. I, the picture I see is the disciples immediately put up the sails, and they're out. And the people are like, hey, where, Jesus, where are you going? So in that mass scramble, there are others who jump into the boats, and they follow along with him. Actually, that is one, one uh, detail of this story that we kind of forget. There are other boats present, and they kind of set out together. Jesus takes off with his disciples, and these guys are trying to catch them or follow, follow them. Because chapter 3, we saw already, Jesus had traveled to, uh, to, the, to the lake, to the Galilee, and people from Gal- had already kind of followed him al- with him, or followed him already. There was no delay. That's one thing that Mark really highlights. There was no delay. Jesus says, let's go, and they went. Jesus escaped 
He wanted to escape the, fatigue, the crowd. Um, was Jesus introverted? I don't know. When I look at this story, when, I, when, I, when I'm around people, I'm introverted. So when I'm around crowds of people, I get very exhausted and tired. You know, last, uh, last week we had a guest over at our house. At one point we had about seven people uh, staying with us. Uh, it was fun. It was great. But after they left, I was like, oh, I could finally breathe. Like when they were there, you know, when you have guests over, you just naturally, you just think about, hey, you guys okay? You guys comfortable providing things for them? Shopping multiple times during the week? Thinking about, oh, where should we go when we have a little bit of time? And all of those things. Spending a whole day teaching, spending the whole day with the crowds, Jesus needed to retreat. And that's why I believe he suggests, hey, let's go to the other side. Mark, more than anyone else, really shows the human side of Jesus. What I mean by that is, if you look at Matthew and John, even Luke's gospel, we don't see, here's moments of, uh, or descriptions of Jesus being fatigued or tired. But Mark, more than anything, wants to make that, make Jesus, the human element of Jesus, Mark really draws that out more than any of the other gospels or gospel authors. And here we see a picture of Jesus is, is so tired that as the boat sets sail, he falls asleep. How big was the boat? I, I don't know. It's enough for, you know, the dis- disciples and Jesus, 13 men. It was big enough for the 13 of them to, to sit. Um, I don't think it was a large ship, but, you know, it was a boat was large enough to hold them. And it was large enough boat that they felt safely, right, to travel on the Sea of Galilee. When I visited Israel um, back in the late 90s, uh, we went onto the lake, uh, and we were in a boat with, you know, 40, 50 foot boat probably, and I felt very safe. But as we were sitting there and we looked at this passage, they said, imagine if you were in a smaller boat, and from the Sea of Galilee, I, I don't know if it's north or west, there was a big there was a mountain range that came across, that, that came, and then right in the middle, it just kind of s- splits down. And they said that that's where usually the wind from the mountains comes through that channel. And so it's very, it's like almost a daily occurrence where you get the, the winds that come through that, and then the waves begin to rise. So when they, when we review this story, they said, imagine how big that storm must have been. Every day you see it. Every day you feel the storm. And yet on this particular day, the situation was very different. Because as they were going on to the other side, a violent storm or violent wind comes. Begins to turn the waves. The waves begin to get bigger and bigger. And what's happening is the, the waves are breaking over the edge of the boat. And the boat begins to take on water. The disciples were in panic mode. They didn't know what to do. And because of the disciples are in panic mode, we can conclude that this was no ordinary storm. Why? What was the profession of some of the disciples before joining Jesus? Fishermen from this region. They had been on this water many times. They had been fishing many times. And I'm pretty sure that they would have experienced a few storms on the Sea of Galilee. Yet on this particular storm, they were literally panicking. These seasoned fishermen were afraid that they were going to basically die. This kind of shows us what kind of storm this must have been. The winds were very powerful, very strong. Easily overwhelmed that boat that they were in, which is why they were in panic mode. Which is why they, I think, screamed at the top of their voice, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care if we die? I, this contrast that Mark shows is, is awesome. 
on the one side, you see the disciples. They're panicking. They're, they're trying to do everything, cupping water with their hands, throwing the water overboard, holding off for dear life. And the boat is just getting rocked. Waves are crashing over. Wind is blowing. They just are in this mode to survive and hang on. Look, literally looking probably to the, to the skies to see, if, is there a break in the storm that's coming? So you see chaos and panic. And, they, and then Jesus, he's sleeping. This contrast that Mark, Mark paints, is, I think, is just it's an amazing thing. They're sitting here trying to figure out how to, how to survive. And I think the expectation, at least among the disciples, is everybody has to do something to try to get the water out or do something. And yet, out of the corner of their eye, as they're frantically trying to, you know, stay afloat, they see someone laying down. And they look carefully, and it's Jesus. I, I imagine Peter's, like, trying to hold on to the boat and trying to get the water out. He looks, and he's like, Jesus! <laughs> Screaming at him, don't you care if we drown? Can you imagine if you're sleeping and someone comes in and wakes you up violently? My kids have a tendency, they've been doing this a lot lately, is uh, in the morning around 7 or so, they come kind of barging into our room. My son usually comes up and he just jumps on the bed. And he finds his way next to me and he's just like, whether he's on top of me or it doesn't matter, he just lays down and he wants to sleep a little bit more. If that happened a long time ago, I think I would have been more upset. But, but I used to be a very uh, angry person when I... How do I, how do I say it? I didn't like it when people woke me up when I was sleeping, especially morning. I, I'm not a really big morning person, but when people woke me up in the morning like camps and retreats and stuff like that. When I'm sleeping and somebody comes in, and, and I had a youth pastor back in the day, he would come in in the morning. You know those, uh, those what are those things called? Megaphones or something like that? It has the siren. He will come in and say, hey, it's such and such time. You know, retreats, they wake you up at 6, right? They wanted you to do devotionals and all of that stuff. 6 o'clock or something, he comes in and is like, hey, wake up, 6 o'clock. Second time he comes through, Everyone's still, the lights are off. Everyone's still sleeping. Third time he comes through, the lights turn on. And so what you do? Put the sleeping bag over your head. And next thing, this loud siren sound going off in my ear. And he's doing, it, he's doing it to each and every single person in the room. And then we would all be angry. I'd be so angry. I'd be like, oh, what are you doing? I, I get very angry when I get woken up. Now I accept it as a fact of daily life, so maybe that's why I don't get as angry. But Jesus is sitting here, he's, and he's sleeping peacefully, and he gets woken up violently, I think. I don't know if it was a shaking of Jesus or it was simply yelling, but, you know, it's clear that the disciples, as they were trying to uh, deal with the storm on their own, that they clearly expected Jesus to be able to do something. What? I don't know. But they clearly expected Jesus to do something. But when they saw him sleeping, instead of saving or rescuing them, I think in their panic and in their fear, they woke him up unceremoniously. Jesus seemed so unaware, so unconcerned. I think that's kind of where they felt maybe hurt. He seemed so unaware, so unconcerned. Jesus has authority over the wind and the waves. And that is the, the main drive, I think, this morning that I want us to see. What happens in verse 39 is actually, I think, one of the greatest demonstrations of, or, of his power and his authority. 
he gets up and he rebukes the wind. He says in verse 39, Quiet. Be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Quiet. Be still. And one, one of the commentaries that, that uh, I read this past week said this. It, it's actually an interesting take that I had never, never kind of thought or processed before. He says to this, Jesus speaks to the wind and the waves as if they were living things. He rebukes them for their insolence and dismisses them with a preemptory, shut up. And the contrast is, is the same emphatic words that's used in chapter 1, verse 25. When he's talking to the unclean spirits, he basically says, be quiet. It's a very stern words. And it could be translated as, you know, uh, as shut up in a very firm way. Be quiet. Jesus speaks to the wind and the waves as if they were living. With three simple words, quiet, be still. The disciples' fears were relieved. Or was it? Because we see now a shift from the fear of the drowning to fear of what just takes place. Verse 41 says this, They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is this? G. Campbell Morgan, uh, in his book, Studies in the Four Gospels, he says this, This fear was not produced by the storm, but by the calm. The fear, the first time they were afraid, that fear was produced by the storm. But the fear that we we're told, the fear that is described in verse 41, is not the storm, but it's the calm. On the one moment, they thought they were going to drown. Next moment, they're, they're thinking, who is this? Who is this guy that even the wind and the waves obey him? Just as quickly as the storm came upon them, it disappeared. I mean, just think about that. All of a sudden, the winds are blowing, the waves are crashing over. All of a sudden, there's a complete calm. The look on their face as they made eye contact with each other, saying, what in the world just happened? Who is this? You see, I think prior to this, they had a certain idea of who Jesus was. Oh, yeah, you know, he, he's teaching with some authority. We've seen some miracles. But today, on this one incident on the lake, this is different. This demonstration of power and authority was nothing like they had ever expected or never seen before. Who is this? They were terrified. Who is this person that we are with? As I said, there, one of the details that's often left out in this story is there were other boats present. The same thing was going on in, the, in, the, in those boats as well, I think. People were just freaking out, maybe trying to get back to shore, trying to get the water, dump the water out. And as, I, as they were doing this, they look at Jesus' boat, and they'd see all of this commotion going on over there too. And all of a sudden, maybe Jesus stands up, and they're like, what? And they're in awe as well. I don't think they heard necessarily what Jesus said, but also they also experienced the calm. I don't know. It, we're not told, but maybe they, when they reached shore, maybe they said, they asked, hey, Peter, what, what happened back there? Oh, you're never going to believe it. Jesus got up. He said, quiet, be still. And the waves and the storm just died out. Because they experienced it, these people might have made a connection.
after Jesus calms the storm, he turns his attention to his disciples. He asks them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? You know, they were rebuked for being afraid or literally cowardly. Didn't they know who Jesus was? Didn't they know who was on board with them? Had they not learned anything yet from the time they spent together? We kind of sense a disappointment in Jesus' voice. It's like, oh, guys, still have no faith? You still don't know? Why are you afraid? I think he expected, I think Jesus expected them to be at peace. Because Jesus was with them in the boat. I think there was an expectation. And one of the, one of the things that I, I, I had, as I studied this passage, and other things that I wrote down in my notes to study later on is, is this one fact. It might be a message down the road, but when Jesus is in the boat with you, what do we have to be afraid? When the storms of life come, when we are faced with the storms of life, one truth remains. Jesus is in the boat with us. He's going through the storm with us. And he is not worried. So why are we? That's, I think that's kind of what Jesus is saying here. Why are you afraid? I'm with you. Don't be afraid. Don't think anything will happen. Do not think, whether I am asleep or awake, do not think that harm will come upon you because I am with you. Disciples knew that Jesus had amazing powers, but to see him controlling the wind and the waves uh, was a new revelation for them. Their faith was still growing. We don't que- I don't question their commitment to follow Jesus. All throughout the, the whole Gospels, you know, even up under the arrest and you know, the trial and the, during the crucifixion of Jesus, we don't question their commitment, even Peter, with his denials. We, I, I don't question his commitment to follow Jesus. They were committed, but it was a journey that they were going. And for us, we, we just kind of see the disciples, you know, we read the stories and we're like, oh, Show this. Jesus, you know, um, even, even at the end, we don't question the commitment to follow Jesus. They were committed, but it was a journey that they were going through. And we read about it, and we, we say, ah, how, can you, how can you miss it? Clearly, Jesus is who he claims to be. Peter, 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 how can you do this? Their faith was still growing. And that's, this is part of that journey. This is part of the process. As they look and as they encounter and experience Jesus, the faith is still growing. They were committed to following Jesus, but they're just really discovering the full extent of Jesus' power and his authority. For the disciples as well as for us, this is uh, one more, I think, vital step along the road to grasping the full truth about Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's basically the objective for me in this series. To help us to see Jesus for who he is so that we can put our faith in him, follow him, walk with him, and become like him. I came across a prayer, a prayer quote this week, and I think it's something uh, that I want us to uh, perhaps take to heart. And it says this, Jesus, help us to discover for ourselves who you are, not only in our minds, but also in practical trust 
and confidence. Let me read that again. Jesus, help us to discover for ourselves who you are, not only in our minds, but also in practical trust and confidence. Let's pray.